Welcome to Hope on Fire, talk radio for life. And now, today's host, Chris Lang. By some accounts, there are more than 40,000 Christian denominations today. But in John chapter 10, Jesus said that there would be one flock and one shepherd. Is there a true Christian church today? Does it have a true prophet? How can we know if we see it? What difference does it make? The answer, everything. Hi, I'm Chris Lang, and I'm your host today on Hope on Fire. Today's episode is titled, End Time Prophets. You know, Jesus warned that many false prophets will arise in the last days and will deceive many. In our film, Mystified, we show that the, this, these false prophets in the last days, their message is going to be universalism. That means that all roads supposedly lead to God. They twist the Bible's teachings about Jesus Christ and the nature of man. He woke up fully to his divine consciousness, to the divine spirit that was given in his very being. And we are called to do the same. So Jesus saves by revealing rather than by fixing. In other words, he doesn't have to fix a rift between God and humanity brought about by sin. Rather, he reveals that there's no rift. Jesus is fully human and fully divine at the same time. Impossible. And the price we've paid for that is most of us don't realize we are human and divine at the same time. What do we mean by calling little old Jesus of Nazareth the Alpha and the Omega of history? To formally say Jesus is God is bad theology is incorrect. If his students Richard Rohr and Paul Nitter weren't obvious enough, Let's be clear what Karl Rahner, the famous Jesuit theologian and chief engineer of Vatican II, taught about Jesus and the nature of man. Rahner believed that the literal incarnation of God in Jesus is a myth, that Jesus was just a man, simply an expression of the non-dualistic unity between divinity and humanity, which can be realized and lived by all. This is the wide road message that leads to destruction that Jesus teaches us. He warns us in Matthew chapter 7. And the narrow road is the one that leads to life. That's the minority view. That's the exclusive view about Jesus Christ who said about himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, verse 6. Look around you today. How many Christians still believe that the Bible is a true account of history and of the future? And that the Bible is the absolute truth of God for mankind? This is the definition of of Christian fundamentalists. This term, fundamentalist, has become an evil term in the mainstream media today. And most people don't know that this term arose in early 20th century Protestantism. Why? If you look into it, you'll find that the term arose because many Christians in the Protestant world started to believe that the Bible was allegorical or a book of stories that wasn't real history, that were nice life life lessons for learning how to live a better life, but not anything that you should take seriously. And the second coming of Christ is you, and the second coming of Christ is still happening. It's not one event, it's the rest of history. The fundamentalist Christian was a group of people who said, no, the Bible is actual history. And we believe 
that it should be taken as the inspired word of God. This minority is increasingly seen today as troublemakers, sort of like the so-called heretics of the Middle Ages, many of whom were burned at the stake. If Jesus told us that there would be many false prophets in the last days, then it must be clear that God has to have a true prophet in the end times. If there's a false prophet, there must be a true. The teachings of that true prophet would have to agree with all the biblical prophets. These prophets in the Old Testament, which was Peter's Bible, he called them holy men of God or holy prophets. The Bible shows a clear pattern that proves this. I'm not talking about an institution. I'm talking about a set of beliefs that arose at the right time in history. As we show in our film Mystified, the great Protestant reformers, William Tyndale and Martin Luther, began a great movement to call the world back to the Bible as the only authority for faith and practice. But you know, friends, God is not finished with the Protestant Reformation yet. The Protestant Reformation is not dead. Does the Bible prove that God has an end-time prophet? Yes, it does. Let's take a, a, a high-level look now at five biblical epochs that actually show God's pattern throughout history in dealing with humanity. Now, before we get started with these five biblical epochs, or major sections of the world's history among God's people, let's look at two biblical foundations that we can stand on as we look at these five major events that happened in God, uh, for God's people in history. The first is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom is no shadow of turning or variableness. In other words, God never changes, and the way he operated in Bible times, we can, we can expect him to operate the same way today. The Bible is a textbook that teaches us how to get to know God's ways. By the way, those were two texts. That was Hebrews 13, verse 8, and James chapter 1, verse 17. So the third Bible verse we're going to look at now is Amos 3, verse 7. And this says that the Lord God will do nothing. He will not do anything unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. First, we've seen that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Secondly, that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is the same. God doesn't change. His word is eternal. And thirdly, God won't do anything in history unless he first reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So these are the three biblical foundations that we're going to build on now. Now, this is what we're going to see, the pattern in these five major world events for God's people. A prophet gives a time prophecy, either definite or indefinite, that is later applied by another prophet who organizes a remnant that is a group of people who want to believe in the first prophet's message, and their faith rests on that prophecy. At the, end of the, at the end of that prophetic period, 
the, the prophetic gift is always manifest the same as it was at the beginning of this prophetic period. Okay? So there's a prophet, there's a definite or indefinite time period. That the, toward the end of that time period, God raises up another prophet, a second prophet, who then applies the first prophet's message to that generation, and those who believe join that prophet with that message and go into the next period of God's history. All right? First is the story of the flood. And this begins with the prophet Enoch. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Jude that Enoch prophesied the end of the world and the coming of Jesus. Enoch had a son, and he named his son Methuselah. Now, this name for thousands of years has been accepted to mean a very special message. And throughout Bible, the Bible, you can find that God oftentimes tells a prophet to name his son or daughter a specific name because it has a message, it carries a message to his people. And so names were very important throughout the Hebrew economy, throughout the ancient history of the Jewish nation. And so Enoch, who was a prophet, names his son Methuselah. And Methuselah means, and I'm going to come back to the modern critics who have twisted its meaning to mean something else in the modern Bibles. But for thousands of years, it, it was accepted to mean Methu, when he dies, Salak or Salah, this is the word that means it will be sent. It doesn't say a flood will be sent. It just says it will be sent. Methu, Salah. Methu, when he dies, Salah. It will be sent. That's all it means. But it was a prophetic message, and every time the name Methuselah was called by his mother, it said when he dies, when this kid dies, it will be sent. And you, if you read the book of Genesis, you find out that Methuselah lived longer than anyone else in history, almost a thousand years. Toward the end of this indefinite time period, God raised up Noah. And for the first time, Noah was told by God, I'm going to send a flood. Get ready. Build a boat. And so Noah became this present truth prophet, this second prophet who's applying Enoch's prophecy through the name of his grandfather, because Methuselah is Noah's grandfather. And, and so he, for 120 years, he's preaching to the pre-flood world. We call them antediluvians. And he's He's warning them that God is going to send a flood. When he dies, it will be sent. And Noah was the first one who received the direct message of what it will be sent means. And so God gave that information to Noah, and he began to apply it to the name of his grandfather. Can you imagine, while Noah's building his boat, he gets his grandfather up on the deck while everybody down below is scoffing and Noah is presenting his grandfather to the world of that day and he's saying, why do you think this guy is so old? <laughs> God has mercy on you. And so for those who don't believe that the flood actually happened, but they claim to be Christians, you, you look through, throughout the New Testament. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24. Uh, Peter talks about it in the book of 2 Peter. Several times he talks about this global flood that destroyed the world. And, uh, and so this is the first epoch. Enoch gives a prophecy, names his son Methuselah. When he dies, it will be sent. God raises up a present truth prophet, Noah, and tells him 
I'm sending a flood. That's what it will be sent means. Get ready. Get a remnant. He gathers together, unfortunately, only eight people who happen to be his family. And those are the only ones who chose to go in the ark and be saved. The Bible tells us that Methuselah died the year of the flood. So Methuselah had his son Lamech when he was 187 years old. And then Lamech, his son, had Noah, Methuselah's grandson, when Lamech was 182. That's 369 years. And then Noah was 600 years old when the flood came upon the earth. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 5, verse 27, that Methuselah died when he was 969 years old. What was the prophecy? His name, Methu, when he dies, Selah, it will be sent. Is it any wonder that the modern critics have tried to change the meaning of Methuselah's name? The second epoch is the exodus from Egypt. And it begins with Abraham in the book of Genesis. When God tells Abraham, uh, uh, by the way, Abraham was a prophet, according to Genesis 20, verse 7. God predicted that Abraham's offspring would be afflicted for 400 years in a foreign land. And in the fourth generation, they would go out with great substance. This is in Genesis 15, 13, verse 13 and 14. Near the end of this prophetic period, God raises up Moses as a prophet. In Deuteronomy 34, verse 10, Moses is called a prophet. And according to Exodus chapter 6, Moses was the fourth generation since his great-grandfather Levi came down into Egypt with his family. By inspiration, Moses records that the children of Israel left Egypt on that very day. That's in Exodus chapter 12, verse 41. The 400-year prophecy was fulfilled. By the way, Moses mentions 430 years here in Exodus 12, 41. But he's counting the years from the time God gave the prediction to Abraham. The 400 years starting point began with Abraham's offspring on the day Isaac was weaned. That's found in Genesis 21 and mentioned also by Paul in Galatians 4. And there's there's more to this, but again, we have... Abraham is given a prophetic message, a specific time period. Toward the end of that period, God comes to Moses in the wilderness and he says, it's time, go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And so he gathers a remnant, they put the blood on the doorposts, Passover came, and the very next day, they leave Egypt the whole of the children of Israel. And it says on that very day, Moses is thinking of all, the, all of the, the anniversaries since God gave that prediction to Abraham. And he's saying, this is the day. This is the anniversary. God is right on time. Isn't that amazing? The third example is the exile, the 70-year exile in Babylon. Jeremiah was a prophet who made the prediction in Jeremiah 25, verse 12. Near the end of this period, the prophet Daniel prays, interceding for God's people so that they can go back home. Haggai and Zechariah also are raised up as present truth prophets. And they're applying that 70-year prophecy that Jeremiah gave They form a nucleus of believers, and they start rebuilding the temple. In Daniel 9, we find the fourth 
epoch, which we explain and illustrate in great detail in, in our film Mystified. This is the 70-week prophecy or the 490-year prophecy, which is the, the messianic prophecy, the coming of the Holy One, the Messiah, the Prince, as Daniel 9 refers to Jesus Christ. This was a 490-year probationary period for the Jewish people that would begin at in 457 BC when Artaxerxes sent Ezra back from the Babylonian exile with the Jews to Jerusalem with money and authority to rebuild the city and renew the sacrificial system. After 69 weeks, or 483 years, Messiah the Prince would be anointed. Near the end of that prophetic period, John the Baptist was raised as a prophet. And right on time, in the year 27 AD, John appears on the scene saying, there is one among you whose sandal strap I am not even worthy to loose. That's in John chapter 1. The Gospels record the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy as John baptizes Jesus. The Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove and remains on Jesus. That's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then the Father speaks this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Also, uh, many people forget that the apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, he, he says, we heard the voice. It was the same message from God the Father. And then he said, Peter said, we have the prophetic word confirmed. What prophecy was he talking about? The prophetic word. He's pointing back to Daniel chapter 9, the messianic prophecy, and everything else that pointed to the Messiah in the Old Testament. But he's specifically reflecting on the fact that we were witnesses. We got the same message as John the Baptist was preaching about. So Jesus was confirmed as Messiah the Prince, the son of a king, exactly as Daniel predicted. Messiah in Hebrew is the same word as Christ in the Greek. It means anointed one. The prophetic gift is always manifest at the end of a definite prophecy. It never fails. And so at the end of this <clears throat> messianic prophecy, John the Baptist is raised. Jesus was also called a prophet who spoke of fulfilling the words of the Old Testament. But then, of course, the apostle Peter says, we're witnesses too. So there were multitudes of prophets that God had raised up to be witnesses of this original prophetic word that he gave to Daniel, okay? And of course, the Christian church was that remnant body that believed in the messianic prophecy, in that message that Jesus was the anointed one that was predicted hundreds of years before he came to this earth. So, Prophetic gift is always manifest at the end of a definite time prophecy. It never fails. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. With him there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. This is the way he wants us to get to know him. He is predictable. When something is going to happen, when a great event is about to break, a prophet predicts it. There's a time prophecy. And when that period is just about reached, another prophet, agreeing with the former prophet, applies that prophetic message in that present time. And with this context, with this understanding of these four examples, 
we can understand now and apply this pattern to this final major prophecy, this fifth biblical epoch. This is now the longest time prophecy in the Bible. It's found in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, and it says unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, as we show in Mystified, the Bible, when it gives prophecy, it, it teaches us that we are to apply the, a day-for-a-year principle. And there are several um, texts that we'll put on the screen from Ezekiel and I believe the book of Numbers that point to this day-year principle. If we know the starting point, we can find the end point in the future based on this day year principle. Now, the prophet Daniel made a precise time prophecy, which also started in the year 457 BC. This was the same t starting point for the 70 week prophecy or 490 year prophecy. These two prophecies start at the same time. And this one continues until the fall of 1844 A.D., at which time another prophet must arise, whose faith rests on that original prediction and then goes about organizing a nucleus who then become a remnant, and they go forth to meet the next and final segment of Earth's history. This is the final prophetic time prophecy in the Bible. There are no more time prophecies after 1844. According to Revelation chapter 10, verse 6, the angel says that there will be time no longer. That's prophetic time. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 32, the Apostle Paul tells us, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Okay, that means all the prophets, all of God's prophets have to agree with each other because they're inspired by the same Holy Spirit. The spirit of Noah jived with the spirit of Enoch, the original prophet. The spirit of Moses agreed with the spirit of Abraham. The spirit of Daniel, Haggai, and Zechariah fitted in with the spirit of Jeremiah. The spirit of John the Baptist fitted in with the original spirit that inspired Daniel. And the spirit and message of a prophet in or around 1844 had to agree with all the prophets before. There's much more to come in our overtime segment to watch the full episode, visit hopeonfire.tv and look for episode 60, End Time Prophets. And please subscribe to our Livestreams Media YouTube channel. I'm Chris Lang. Thanks for joining me today. Hope on Fire is produced by Livestreams Media, a nonprofit film production ministry. To access this program or to make a donation, please visit hopeonfire.tv. See you next time, and may God set your hope on fire. Welcome back. I'm Chris Lang, your host on Hope on Fire. Today we're talking about end-time prophets. There are false prophets, as Jesus prophesied in the book of Matthew 24, who was giving a list of his last events in Earth's history. And the very first warning, he said, beware that you be not deceived. And he later talks about many false prophets that will rise up and deceive people. And of course, these false prophets, as we've identified, are claiming to be Christian. Now, we were just going through the five biblical epochs to show how God interacts consistently throughout history. And we were just unpacking the fifth epoch, the last 
prophecy in the Bible, time prophecy, the 2300-day prophecy from Daniel 8.14, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And we were explaining through the four previous examples that there was a prophet who gave a prediction. Near the end of that prophecy, God raises up a second or more prophets who then apply the first prophet's message in their generation, and we call that present truth. And then they gather a nucleus of believers called a remnant who then go forward into the next chapter of Earth's history. And so let's continue with this discussion as we get back to the program in episode 60, End Time Prophets. I hope this is blessing you today. I know it is me. And the heart of the message must be saturated with the themes of the 2300-day prophecy. What are those themes? It's a judgment hour message taking place in the heavenly sanctuary. In the book of Hebrews, it says the Lord pitched it and not man, speaking of the heavenly sanctuary. The word cleansed means that we're being justified, vindicated, exonerated through Christ. Just as it was in the Hebrew Day of Atonement, when all the sins of the people were cleansed from the sanctuary, in essence, this is a message of righteousness by faith. That is, a cleansing of the soul temple, my soul, cleansed by the Holy Spirit. This is the concept from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, let's, let's look at some of the movements in the 1800s, around this time of 1844. There was 1830, Joseph Smith, he published the Book of Mormon. He claimed that Moroni, the supposed spirit of a dead man, who was later called Angel Moroni, directed him to some buried plates inscribed with some kind of Judeo-Christian history of American civilization. Then in 1848, the Fox sisters became known for helping to ignite modern spiritualism. Then there's Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of the Christian science religion in 1879, at the same time, another group was formed, which later became the Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's not even counting others like Sister Anne and Helena Bavatsky, who was the forerunner of the New Age. And she was famous for being an occultist and for attempting to merge Western Christianity with Eastern philosophy, that is Buddhism and Hinduism. So Helena Blavatsky was also rising up in the 1800s as a well-known prophet. Now, let me ask you a question. Was Joseph Smith interested in the 2300-day prophecy, the cleansing of the sanctuary, Righteousness by faith, these principles from the Bible, these prophetic principles. Uh, how about Mary Baker Eddy or the Fox Sisters or Helena Blavatsky or the founders of the Jehovah's Witnesses? You can't find any of their writings that focused on Daniel's 2300-day prophecy from Daniel chapter 8. Now, at the right time, with the right kind of message, fitting in with the Bible, and taking the prophetic message of Daniel and making it present truth, there came a young woman, her name was Ellen Gould Harmon, who later married James White. 
She went through the great disappointment with thousands of other Millerites who expected Jesus to come in the fall of 1844. She was part of a small group that pleaded with God for understanding and for wisdom as well. Lord, we have not lost our faith, but we seek wisdom to understand why you have not returned. We need you to show us the way forward. Daniel's prophecy states that at the end of the 2,300 days, the sanctuary will be cleansed. And what if we mistook the meaning of the word sanctuary? But the sanctuary is the earth. Is it? Daniel says in chapter 7, And behold, one like the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days, not to the earth as we believed. So where is the Ancient of Days? In heaven. After his death on the cross, Jesus became our High Priest and the work of redemption moved from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. Ellen. 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 This is the inspired testimony of God. She began to have visions and she began to write. She eventually became one of the most published authors of all time, 25 million words written on an innumerable list of subjects, the bulk of which were geared towards helping people understand the Bible. Study what she said about the Bible. Study the fruits of her life. And as Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. There is nothing of any significance that Seventh-day Adventists do as a denomination that didn't come through her ministry. Health practices, medical work, schools, publishing. Because our work has really begun. Do we base our faith on the writings of Ellen White? There are many who claim that Seventh-day Adventists make her writings equal to the Bible. This is not true at all. The Holy Scriptures are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the test of experience. If you had made God's Word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard, you would not have needed the testimonies. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light, the Bible. I do not ask you to take my words. Lay Sister White to one side. Don't quote my words until you can obey the Bible. I exalt the precious word before you. The Bible alone is our standard of faith and doctrine. In fact, Ellen White called herself the lesser light that was intended to lead people to the greater light, that is the Bible. And she even said that we wouldn't have needed her writings if people had simply read the Bible for themselves. Now, I've heard many people claim that Ellen White was a mystic, and they claim that it's because she had all of these visions. Um, she did have a lot of visions. She had hundreds of visions, and they were witnessed by <clears throat> many witnesses. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but to the end thereof are the ways of death. She quotes from the verse beneath her finger. But what is the difference between the mystic that we define and show many examples in our film Mystified and Ellen White? Big difference. We show in Mystified also what does a biblical trance look like. In the book of Acts, 
the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter both state that they fell into a trance. That is, the word, the Greek word there, is what, where we get the word ecstasy from, which means out of mind or out of body. God's people in the Bible are not mystics. They're never found emptying their minds, using breathing exercises, intentionally pursuing an altered state. Fear not, for I am your shield. Your reward shall be great. When the God of the Bible speaks to a human, they're actively working, consciously praying, or sleeping. I was in the city of Joppa, praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Notice that they were actively praying before the trance date happened. It was evident that God had a special message for them that required a visionary experience. The trance state itself is not inherently good or evil, which means that human faculties can be possessed either by God's Holy Spirit or by other spirits. Throughout the Bible, we see how do God's people pray? Moses spoke to God face to face as a man speaks with his friend. That's found in the book uh, of Exodus, chapter, 30, chapter 33. Moses was a friend of God, and he talked to him face to face as a man speaks to his friend, not in an altered state of consciousness. The point is, nowhere in the Bible does God teach us to use repeti repetition, mantras, like is being taught in Christianity today through these Eastern forms of practices that have been, have been practiced in, in the Catholic Church through the monasteries and the convents for over a thousand years. Famous Catholic monk Thomas Merton said, It is in fact absurd and impossible to try to grasp God as comprehended by our minds. We must transcend ourselves by repetitive invocation of the name of Jesus. Nowhere does the Bible promote mantras, prayer beads, or chants, the mystic's type of meditation. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. Every major religion at its more mature levels is trying to give you some kind of method to compartmentalize the mind, to put the mind to the side. And what they found out is things like mantras, chants, anything you repeat has that effect. Prayer beads are not unique to the rosary in Catholicism. If you've been to Asia, you find them all over Asia. If you go to the Islamic world, you'll see people on the streets with their prayer beads all over. Every religion has discovered that. Only Protestantism, which came along far too late in history, when we were really getting into the head and into sermons and words and Bible quotes and everything, it didn't understand that anymore. It's probably the only major world religion that doesn't have something like prayer beads or chants. But those are not biblical practices. The trance that you see in the book of Acts is, a, is, is very specific that Peter and Paul were praying, actively praying, when the Holy Spirit came in and took over their faculties. Now, you've heard the phrase, a picture paints a thousand words, right? In the same way, there are times when God knows that a human being can't put into words the message God needs to give them. And so a visionary experience is required in order for them to then be inspired 
by the pictures God gives them in a vision. Maybe it's a dream, but in some visionary state, their faculties were taken over because they had surrendered to the God of heaven, but they were not seeking a trance state. That's the key. Ellen White did not seek an altered state of consciousness. One day at noon, I was writing. I had written thus far when I lost consciousness, and I seemed to be witnessing a scene in Battle Creek. Then I aroused from my unconsciousness, and for a while could not think where I was. My pen was still in my hand. It is a fully conscious practice to pray and to live by faith in an objective word. And it is that word, that's the scriptures, that give the prophets and us believers a filter by which all of our experiences can be judged, whether they be from God or whether they be from another spirit, the fallen angels. Now, Helena Bavatsky, she said that the only people who will believe in a literal physical return of Christ at the end of the world, quote unquote, are Millerites or Seventh-day Adventists. Millenarians and Adventists of robust faith may go on saying that the coming of the carnalized Christ or the physical manifestation is near at hand. Theosophists who understand the hidden meaning of the universally expected avatars, they know that it is no end of the world but the consummation of the age. In this she means the close of a cycle. She's teaching evolution, friends, and a new age Jesus. Mystified explains what a fundamentalist is, and Blavatsky is describing exactly who the fundamentalists are at the end. Those are people who believe in the absolute truth of the Bible and are looking for the literal return of Jesus. They're going to be in a minority that resist the new world order or the one world religion, which is what we see happening that is being powered and fueled by mysticism today. And the second coming of Christ is you, and the second coming of Christ is still happening. It's not one event, it's the rest of history. I wanna finish this, um, this talk today by sharing something very important. As true as the Bible is to show us these five epochs, these five major events in world history that show the pattern of God's work through his prophets to lead his people through crisis and beyond. It's important that we talk about this last point, and that is, it's not enough to be right. It's not enough to be part of a movement of destiny with a present truth prophet. That's why I shared some of my own personal journey in recent Hope on Fire episodes. We are to have a living experience with Jesus Christ. And then out of that overflow, we are to be witnesses of a living reality to a dying world. You know, there, there are so many people out there that are telling you that you can't have a connection with the God of heaven unless you practice mysticism. And that is not true. <laughs> not true at all. The true God of heaven doesn't ever speak to a person when they seek altered states of consciousness. Now, God protects people who are deceived. You've seen the evidence in our film Mystified of how God covered Stephanie, for example, when she was deceived for nine years in practicing so-called contemplative prayer, which is the Christianized form of mysticism, going into altered states, alpha states, 
so that supposedly God can speak to you in your subconscious. But the key is we can have a living experience with, with Christ and we must have it. If we don't, we only have ideas and nobody ever gave their life for an idea. Jesus said in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and no one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that an amazing promise? <laughs> in crazy times, we are called to rest in our shepherd's arms. That's, that's why Psalm 23 is probably the most famous psalm in the, in the whole Bible. Because it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me through green pastures. He, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. That's the message of the whole of scriptures, is that we are not to be afraid of the future. And we are not to be guilted by our past mistakes because our shepherd has paid the price on Calvary. And if you don't know Jesus, you can have a lot of information about him, but if you don't know him, you're going to be afraid, very afraid of what's coming on the earth, literally. Doesn't matter what the mystics are claiming, that we've always been and we always will be, and we've never had a beginning and we'll never have an end. Oh, my friends, why are we still here? It's because God has never had an army of people in mass who love and serve him just for his own sake and not for anything they can get out of him. Well, there have been individuals like Abraham and Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, Martin Luther, but never a worldwide army. And for thousands of years, the devil has shake, shakes his finger at God, and he says, where are your people? Here are all my people. No one can keep your law, and no one will serve you without those goodies you always give them. Without strings attached, no one will serve you. No one will love you just because you deserve it. But here's the thing, my friends. The devil studies prophecy also. He can't tell the future. We know this from the chapter of Daniel 2. If the devil could read a human person's mind, now he can guess, he's been around thousands of years, but if he could read your mind, he would have been able to tell his sorcerers who served King Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamed, right? But they couldn't. And they were going to be murdered that night by the king because they could not tell the king his dream. And it was Daniel that God gave a dream to that saved the lives of all the sorcerers and magicians in Babylon that night. Isn't that something? So the devil, the devil studies the Bible's prophecies because he doesn't know the future. And he knows that as long as he can keep this group from forming, this last day group, this remnant that follows this prophetic message, this movement of destiny, he can save his hide just a little bit longer because he knows, he knows that someday soon he's going to no longer exist. But my friends, make no mistake, God will have his worldwide army Revelation 14 calls it the 144,000. But here's the key. They're not just going to worship God with correct doctrine. Revelation 14 verse 12 says, Here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. 
when God has a people who finally worship him in spirit and in truth, then he can say to the universe, here they are, (laughs) earth's darkest hour will be God's finest hour. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. In a world that increasingly rejects the Bible, people are still willing to listen to stories. That's why I do films, seeking to reach people through stories that convict the heart and teach the truth and bring hope. Revelation 12 verse 11 says, And they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. As I mentioned before, none of the martyrs ever gave up their life for an opinion. No one ever gave up their life for a theory or an idea. When the world is embroiled in unprecedented chaos, God needs a people who can calmly explain what it all means. People who know more than concepts, people who know more than the broad sweep of history, they know a person. They can speak a good word for him. Yes, we're a movement of destiny, but it's not about a denomination. God is looking for a people who can help him close shop. Present truth prophets cry out, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Very soon, friends, there will not be 40,000 denominations, only two sides. The side of Jesus Christ, the exclusive narrow road, or Satan. Every other belief system that tells you You don't need to repent. Every other worldview that has another God, every other worldview that says you don't need a savior, every other worldview that says, don't worry, it's all evolution. We're growing up in God, and evolution is the birth canal into divine life itself. And the second coming of Christ is you, And the second coming of Christ is still happening. It's not one event, it's the rest of history. That's the side of Satan. In the end, we will be possessed. As I mentioned and mystified, we'll either be possessed by the Holy Spirit or by fallen angels. What a privilege. What a privilege, friends, to be alive today and that God invites you and me to join him for his finest hour. I hope this blessed you today, and I hope you'll join me again next time here on Hope on Fire. God bless you.